live from the rooftop of the Herman London Real Estate Group in beautiful downtown Maplewood, it's the St. Louis Realtor Podcast with Adam Cruz and Shannon St. Pierre. Welcome, welcome everybody to the St. Louis Realtor Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Cruz. I'm the broker owner of the Herman London Real Estate Group in beautiful downtown Maplewood, Missouri. I'm here joined uh, always with my wonderful co-host, Shannon St. Pierre. Hello. Also a realtor. Uh, doing a lot of good things lately, right, Shannon? Yes. Things are still going well. Things are still going well. And we uh, are excited because one of the popular topics that we get asked about is about estate sales, you know, and our podcast is all about real estate, but it seems like estate sales kind of go hand in hand um, with real estate. And so what we've got here today is Mr. Jeff Randall. He is our special guest. And Jeff, you're the owner of Pennies in Your Pocket Estate Sales. Is that correct? It is. Penny's Wonderful. Your Pocket Estate Sales Services. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. My pleasure. My pleasure. And thanks for being here. I guess if you don't mind, would you just kind of get us a little bit, get us started off with just a little bit of information about you and your company and just kind of a general overview before we start into with all of our questions? Sure. Absolutely. What's well, family owned and operated. It's me and my wife and my oldest son, Ford, we're the three principals of the business. And of course we do have staff that help us and been with us for many years. We actually started back in 1999. Uh, it was more of a part-time operation until uh, up to around 2009 when we decided to do it full-time. And uh, so we are full-time and we're, uh, Licensed or not licensed, but LLC to do estate sales in both Missouri and Illinois. And we do all kinds of sales from the very, uh, say, simple, modest type of estate sale to a house full of high end collectibles, art, you name it. Um, we've done it. And you did the estate sale for uh, when my aunt passed away. You guys handled the estate sale for that. That's how I got to meet you. And what I noticed when I came over there while you guys were kind of, you guys were sort of pricing and organizing things and, you know, the family was shoving whatever we could into our trunks, you know, <laughs> but what I noticed is that it was, it's really hard work what you guys do. It's, it was very physical, you know, you're having to pick everything up, lift it, move it around. And so it's hard work, but I'm, I'm curious. And I know Shannon's got a lot of questions for you too, but I'm curious how did you get your knowledge to be able to kind of be a pricing expert on literally everything? Yeah, well, thanks for recognizing that it's, uh, you know, it's not necessarily an easy task or a job. We enjoy doing it. And, um, you know, we've been doing it for like so long time, but it, I, I appreciate recognizing that it, it, there's more to it than just throwing tables up in a, maybe a living room and, and putting things on tables and, and coming up with prices. Pricing is very important, and uh, unfortunately, it's uh, not a not a science. It's more of an art, you know. And and so for us, uh, where we really, um, you know, come to the sale with uh, knowledge and experience, just from doing it week in and week out, because it's um, it's amazing how it doesn't really matter what zip code you're in. A lot of the things that you see in one house, you'll see in another home. I mean, so it carries over from a state sale to a state sale. But when you do uh, run into those items that are different collectibles, um, uh, we know how to do the research. My wife, Regina and I are both certified uh, personal property appraisers. So we do, in addition to doing estate sales, we're hired by trust companies, insurance companies, uh, law firms to go in and sometimes just appraise the items that are in the home. So that gives us uh, added um, expertise, if you will, and experience of knowing how to do the research when needed. Our plan is to price it as close to fair market value as we can uh, because we only have basically two days to sell it. It's not like you're putting it in an uh, antique mall that could be there for months. So um, Pricing is important and you don't want to price too low because then you're not uh, really serving your client the best way you can. And then you don't want to overprice it because people will turn around and walk out and they're not buying anything. So sure. it's an important kind of part of the estate sale process. 
Yeah, you have to sort of know what something is, what it was probably bought for, how old it is, um, what it would sell for if you had a year to sell it. And then you also, I guess, have to know your local market and what's, you know, generally what kind of people are going to come to the sale too, right? To see what they might pay for something. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, today um, you can almost find anything you want online, really. You can go to what other website, eBay, most people will go, they know about eBay and you can go. And if you're looking for a particular island item, you know, a lot of people can go online and, and do a lot of research and, um, and that's affected um, prices in a lot of different categories. Uh, used to years ago, and actually when we started um, 20 years ago, um, people would use the estate sale as a place to kind of go and do their treasure hunting. And, yeah. you know, especially the collectors looking for very specific items that they might want to collect. Um, we still have that. And thankfully, there are still a lot of collectors out there, but it's just a little bit different. And because there's a, a larger sort of universe of uh, uh, items out there, inventory, it does affect pricing. And so do you find it challenging? I mean, I know that you probably know the price points, but do you find that you come against the owners, um, the property owners, um, and they feel that their property is worth way more than what it really is? You know, like we sometimes deal with that with selling a house. Like everyone feels like their house is worth a million because it holds all their memories. And, you know, it's a personal thing. Absolutely. We call that uh, emotional pricing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and absolutely, we, we run into that an awful lot uh, because they know maybe what they paid for a particular item or they know what mom and dad paid for it. And so, um, you know, sentimental value also runs into that. You know, I played with that when I was a child and I have all these great memories, so it's priceless to me. And so, yes, we run into that all the time. And, and you know, we try to, uh, in the best way, res in a respectful way, just, you know, inform them, educate them that um, the price that maybe they think it really should be sold for and what we would price it for, um, the reasons why. and and Part of what I just mentioned about the universe is bigger. And so they people can go on eBay or other websites and find pretty much anything they want. But we, you know, people were, once you kind of explain that to them, they, you know, a lot of times they'll understand it. And, um, and I will just simply say, sometimes if, if there's really a sentimental value to something, it doesn't matter what I price it for because they might really have regrets that they sold it anyway, no matter what they get for it. So I really encourage them when they're really struggling over that, I'll say, you know what, you're not ready to let go of that. Just hang on to it, enjoy it for a little bit more. But uh, we, you know, we do the best we can to ensure them that why we're pricing it, the price that we're pricing it, and you know, is based on what the market will bring. Awesome. Yeah, so can you kind of go in and tell, explain the process of an estate sale? I mean, I know I've gotten the questions, and, you know, because we, I'm sure Adam, I know he does work with um, clients sometimes. We get the downsizers, which I'm sure is one of your biggest besides, you know, death, downsizing, what, divorce. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, you know, debt maybe, but um, so you get downsizers and they're just like, do I just throw this stuff away? What's the process of an estate sale? Is this stuff even worth anything? Is it, you know, um, and I have never really been able to answer the questions in regards to the estate sale versus having a yard sale. Can you kind of go through the process of why, um, why have an estate sale or maybe a yard sale? Sure, absolutely. And it, it's interesting that you mentioned downsizing sales almost before you even brought up the, the traditional type of estate sale where, you know, someone passes away. And I will tell you out of all the estate sales that we do every year, over half of them are sales for people who are downsizing. They just want to uh, declutter and are they just, you know, they're going from a larger home to a smaller home. 
Um, they want to feel like they want to breathe a little bit and they feel like all the stuff that's been part of their life for 20, 30, 40 years is starting to suffocate them. And so they come to realize, Hey, you know, there's more to life than stuff. So a lot of our, <laughs> so a lot of our estate sales or downsizing sales. Um, but here's what I like to tell people. And mm -hmm. this is a real simple, very first part of the conversation when they're thinking about having a state sale is I will tell them that once you have what it is that you want to keep, either off site or out of sight, you're done. It's that simple. Because what we're going to do as a company, and 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 you know, all the other companies do the same thing, uh, for the most part. You know, the next step is to then go into the home. You take your tables, and if you need cases and whatever you might need to then begin setting up the house, displaying the items, um, staging the house for the, the sale, because. Um, an estate sale is, is it's, it's a tag sale. It's not an auction. What we do is a tag sale. So we price everything. So then when we open the doors on the weekend uh, for them to come in, they're going into that house and they're looking around from table to table, room to room, and they're what we call shopping the house. And then whatever they want to buy, they take those items to the cashier and pay for them. Um, so, you know, kind of back to also your question is well, what's the difference between maybe a, an estate sale versus a yard sale um i would say what's the difference between a private sale versus a professional sale typically a, a yard sale or grad sale is a a private sale and an estate sale or a downsizing sale is a professional type of sale run by a company like ourselves and what we bring to the sale, and, and many companies would do the same, is um, we're going to bring uh, a lot of people because most of state sale companies have very loyal followers, shoppers, if you will. So they watch for our sales and they follow us. And wherever we go, they follow us. So we're going to bring a lot of people to that estate sale. Pricing. Um, we're going to know how to price to get the most out of it even though you might be having to pay a, a fee overall, even after you pay your fee in the real estate world, there's commissions. When you factor in uh, what, what they net after the fee, in most cases, they're going to uh, net a lot more than if they do it themselves. So from just a making more money, uh, it, it tends to lend itself to doing an estate sale. Plus, there are a lot of people who do it themselves. They get really frustrated. They, it's a lot of work. They go to the sale. They open the garage door. People come up, and the first thing, they have a quarter on it, and you take a nickel. Well, after you've heard that for two or three hours, the next thing you want to do is just give it away. Well, we don't do that. Um, and there's very few items in the state sales that are priced <laughs> for a quarter or 50 cents or whatever. So those are some of the differences between, I think, a private sale versus a professional sale. And one of the things I like to tell people, don't throw away anything until you have someone come and look at it, because you may be throwing away money. Yeah, so that's kind of that question is too, because I mean, some people are like, well, I mean, like, I don't know that this is worth anything. I got some old crock pots, I got some old pans, I got some old random tables here, but nothing major, nothing big. These aren't big items, but um, is it worth just leaving things behind? Because I've had someone leave stuff behind and then go, I don't know what to do with it. I guess we'll throw it in a dumpster. Is that when you would actually come to, do you ever go and take a look and say, yes, this is worth doing an estate sale or no yard sale? Because a lot of this is going to be a few bucks, maybe, uh, right. you know, I, I, a few dollar items that are just a few bucks to right. even lower. Well, Actually, uh, that's the very first step I recommend is meeting with the potential client in the home. And, and so we would go the there house. and we would do the walk through of the house and see what's there. And, and I do you sometimes people, recommend just doing the yard sale versus what you would do? Um, if, if they have such a little amount of things, okay. I would say you might be better off just doing it yourself, whether it's a garage sale or yard sale. But um, usually, most people, when you look at 
a typical home. And even if you take some things out, like if you, you know, family or friends, they select certain items that they want to keep, there's still enough in most homes to conduct an estate sale. But I like to tell people, don't throw away anything until I have had a chance to look at it because everything has a potential of selling. I mean, we sell the, the typical like furniture, home decor, uh, collectibles. That's kind of the typical and pots and pans. But we also sell paper products, chemicals, cleaning products. I mean, I can I can sell aluminum foil all day and I can really? sell. Yeah. That's awesome. And now they don't sell for a lot of money, but it's part of all of it. And when you have also a, a large sort of variety of items and categories, you know, that's how you get more and more people. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we just real quick, we did one estate sale not too long ago, just to give you an example where they had a patio filled with what they call trash. And they said, nothing out there, it's all junk, all trash. And a lot of it was. Well, <laughs> you know, we have to kind of look and see and make sure. And sure enough, we found things that we, brought back in. When we sold those items, we sold an additional $500 toward to the sale that they thought was trash. Well, that's well, awesome. the way, you know what they say, you know, someone's trash is someone else's treasure, right? <laughs> well, and here's the other way to look at it is because a lot of things that uh, people think are, tra you know, they're trash and that no one's going to want it. They're thinking about that item for what it originally was used for. But a lot of times people who buy things at estate sales repurpose. They'll buy things for parts and pieces. They'll turn it into art. So even if there's a broken whatever, they might, there might be parts and pieces that someone could take from that and sell or use. So, you know, it's, it's just different. I, I have people all the time who tell me, well, we've already donated all the clothing. And because you don't sell clothing or no one wants to buy clothing. And I tell people, you know, we sell clothing every weekend. Um, will we sell it all? No. But again, it, it adds to the overall. So, yeah, it's amazing what people will buy. I'm still, I've been doing this a long time and I still shake my head at what they buy and what they don't buy. <laughs> Shannon, when I go to an estate sale, the first thing I do is go into the garage. Uh, do you have a, where do you go normally? I never really go to estate sales, which is why I know, I know. I what do you do with your with Saturdays? I show houses. Oh, you keep, keep doing that. Keep doing that. <laughs> but Sundays, is Sunday the better day to go, Jeff? Because it's often on, on, everything's on sale on Sunday, right? Well, typically Sunday, or for, for some sales or a lot of companies, Sunday would be their last day. We, as a company, we do Friday and Saturday. So our okay. last day is Saturday. But to answer your question, what usually happens the very first day, prices are firm. You know, they're not negotiable, typically. Um, and then the second day, or the last day, is when you reduce, or you reduce and negotiate. And because what you wanna do, and what we have found, what works for us, if we price the house and the items in the house as close to fair market value as we think it should be priced. We will sell more on the first day at full price than selling it at reduced on the second day, Saturday. Now, the people who buy on Friday or the first day will still come back sometimes and buy on the second day, but they want to make sure they buy what they really, really want that first day. And then, that makes sense. And then they'll come back. So, um, Typically, the second day or the last day would be the re reducing of prices. And so what if um, somebody isn't out of their home yet? So if they're moving, but they're, they're, they haven't been able to move yet, but they have a, a lot of stuff to sell, do you recommend that everything that's going to be for sale in a couple rooms and everything needs to be, everything personal that's being kept? has to go to a different location or different rooms or, you know, does it get a little messy when things are mixed? Well, it's interesting you asked that question because um, 
there are some companies that will simply say no. If, if the person is still in the home or stuff, they, they, they'll simply say no. And I understand that. Uh, we kind of uh, look at each situation uh, and assess kind of what it, what their situation is, what what kind of, how big the house might be, what is it they're keeping versus what they're selling. Because um, if it's a situation where the person still has to live in the home, and then maybe they're not keeping a whole lot, and if they can put those items, as you indicated, maybe store them in an extra bedroom or someplace that's off-site, should be secure, but at least off-site, out of sight. And then we also require that the client uh, needs to be out of the house during the setup and then during the sale so that they have to go somewhere, Barnes and Noble yeah. or somewhere, um, and uh, allow us to do our thing. And then on the weekend, the same process. So we as a company have done those types of sales. They're not our favorite because it can add layers, but you know, it can be done, but it's not the best situation. The best situation is if the person can have everything they want out of the house, they should do that as well as themselves. I could see that, that it takes out some complexities and confusion and mistakes, possible mistakes. So, well, uh, I don't want to accidentally sell something that they didn't want me to sell. Well, if you sell it at a good enough price, they may not mind. <laughs> yeah, <you're going. laughs> I'm just saying money talks sometimes. Yes, it's correct. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and so what happens if you don't sell everything on the second day, whatever, um, do you just say, okay, thanks very much. And cause if they've moved down, they're moving on, then you have this house of stuff kind of maybe left over, then what? Right. And there will always be stuff left over. You can have right. a great sale, you know, the number be a great number and the clients are thrilled to death and thought that they sold more and they're happy with the the dollar total, but there will always be stuff left. We as a company, uh, we don't clean it out or clear it out because that's not our expertise. We don't have really have the staff to do that. And in today's sort of world of disposing items, it's not as easy as it used to be. You used to be able to call charity. A lot of times in the past, they would just show up and take take everything. Well, now, they don't always do that, or they will only take certain things. You can't just throw things away without having to pay a fee. So what we do is we, we at least keep the house at the end. We organize all the things that are left so it's not trashed. And then I work with a number of professional clean out people. And that uh, I'm using the word professional. They, this is what they do for a living. They're insured, they're reliable, they're ethical, they're, you can scratch it, check all the boxes. And then I either will coordinate the clean out efforts with that company if the client wants me to, or I just hand over the names to the client and then they begin connecting with the companies and they, do what they need to do afterwards. Um, now there are some companies out there that will provide clean out services after the sale. We just don't do that. It's an important part and we will help you by connecting with someone who does that. We just don't do it. The hoarder in me thinks that having a clean out company would be the best job there is. I just think that that'd <laughs> be great to go and, but I'm sure that's also really hard work and I think the clean out. Cleaning out after your estate sale is a lot different than the clean outs that are done on some of these properties that I'm going into, you know, because you guys have already gone through the stuff and it's, you know, you priced it and I'm guessing the junk that's like actual trash trash is actually is gone already. Well, as we set up the house for the estate sale, whatever trash that we come across, yes, it's a bag. It's either ready to be picked up or it's at least, um, put somewhere in a nice neat area. So the trash, the house is not trash. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, you know, a lot of the things that are typically left at the end of the sale are typically the same type of items we see every weekend that people are just not interested in buying. And, um, and what is that? 
Well, uh, clear glass, for example, crystal, um, um, things, uh, figurines, uh, decorative plates, wall plates that, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, the collectibles that maybe my grandmother or mother and grandmother would have collected and put in their china cabinet, the younger folks, they're not interested in that. So we find a lot of that left uh, and just not desirable. You know, old mugs, coffee mugs, that kind of thing. But usually it's also the items that don't have a high value anyway. You know what I mean? They're not high-end items that, oh, we just didn't sell them. Uh, but there's always stuff left. And so what does sell well at estate sales? What's well, always, like you always have the stuff left over, you just said, so what always sells? Right, right. Well, um, mid-century furniture, uh, mid-century decorative type of uh, decor, that's still hot, um, desirable. Um, old toys, metal toys from the 50s and 60s. Oh, wow. And 70s. And now we're kind of getting into, into the 80s and some of the games you know, that were coming in to, uh, the, you know, the gaming systems that were kind of coming into the 80s and early 90s are becoming a little bit more desirable and collectible. Um, contemporary type of home decor, decor is uh, popular and will sell. Smaller items, smaller pieces of furniture that people can kind of just pick up and throw in the back of their SUV tends to sell. Um, and so, you know, those are tools. Uh, people love to buy tools. Uh, yeah. the pra <laughs> practical items that you see in a garage, like uh, people, you know, uh, you work in your garden tools, yard tools, those are very popular. That's interesting. I mean, when you think of estate sales, and I think that that's where, I think this is a great interview because, um, I think of estate sales, I think um, grandmother stuff or stuff that I just, you know, like I didn't think of tools, like I should be going to estate sales for the tools alone. Um, but I, I, you know, or just random, I don't know, chemicals, like you said. <laughs> Cleaning products, you know, box yeah. spray, things that you would, if you went to, you know, whatever store and you would pay three or four dollars for a can of bug spray, and we might sell a half a can or almost a full can. It might have a dollar on it. Well, you know, people, I, I sell that every weekend. It goes that's, that's hysterical crazy. though, but yeah. yeah. I, I, bought a, uh, I bought a tile saw for like $5, something like four or five years ago. I've never used it once, but I had to have it. It was a good deal. <laughs> That's it right. still sits on the it? shelf in my garage. But was I, it? I cut tile, and some of them I'm just like, no way. <laughs> I should probably throw it away because I will probably never cut tile, but the, I'll need it the weekend after I do. Yes, you I'll will. just save it for your estate sale. That's yeah, right. That's right. Okay. Adam is collecting up for his own estate sale. Right. Yes, yes. <laughs> um. And so what is what so what are the biggest challenges in establishing and running an estate sale? Is I mean you've kind of mentioned I think a through a few of these throughout. Well, we've always kind of uh, described doing estate sales as doing several major events every weekend. <laughs> because each estate sale, and we typically will do two estate sales every weekend. We've done as many as four estate sales every weekend. But, but every, most weekends for us, we do two estate sales. So we're having almost every week two major events. And the reason why we say that is because here's what kind of the dynamics of a sale. You're on the front end of that, you're dealing with the client. Perhaps we're dealing and working with the realtor. Uh, we love real, we love you. We love realtors and agents because we do get a lot of referrals and leads from people like yourself who are you're reaching out and helping your client. And so, you know, we've got that sort of dynamic with the client. And so you go in and you price, you set up the house and get it ready. And you do that pretty much the, the week of the sale. And then the actual weekend, now you've invited all these people to come to this house in this community. And sometimes there's great parking available. Sometimes there's not. So as a company, you really need to be aware of that. 
we as a company want to be a good neighbor while we're there for those two days. So you have to organize sometimes parking. And then people sometimes will have anywhere from 50 to hundreds of people at the door waiting to get in. Well, prior to COVID, um, you know, you could let 25 people in the house, 30, depending on how big the house was. And, you know, you can manage that. Well, now, as of today anyway, we're only allowed a total of 10 people in the house, which includes our staff. So if I have two people in the house, it's eight. Um, we're hoping that's going to be um, uh, lifted, and I think it will in a couple of weeks. But but it's just, you know, you've got to look at having a, a state sale as, you know, a lot of moving parts and pieces and uh, dealing with the client, dealing with the neighbors, dealing with the customers and the buyers. and um, and so I think it's important as people are thinking about having a state sale or a downsizing sale that one of the that they do is they go, maybe they visit a number of estate sale companies and see how they run them, see how they're handled and see how they manage parking and that kind of thing. Um, because it can be more than what people anticipate. I was kind of wondering because if I was looking for an estate sale, I would be going, you know, on a Saturday morning before I go out estate sailing, I am generally going to be looking on maybe Facebook marketplace or Craigslist or estate sales.net. And I'm guessing that that's an important part of your business is making sure you do a good job marketing. And is that a, one of the questions that you get a lot from sellers who are kind of interviewing estate sale companies? Is it is. Yes, it is. And, and, how we basically advertise all of our estate sale is through uh, the website, estatesales.net. Um, it's a great website. I wish I owned it <laughs> because they do a great job. And uh, I, would, I would say without knowing 100% sure, but I would say most estate sale companies are using estatesales.net as their platform. We do. Uh, we also, you know, we have a website, our social media, Facebook. Uh, my wife, Regina, is the one who really manages that and, and controls it, if you will. Uh, so making sure that the word gets out. We do not, because it's just not, we found it's not necessary. We don't put any ads in like the local paper. The only exception to that might be if you're in a very, very small town or community where their local paper is read faithfully. Sure. Uh, but in St. Louis and the bi-state area, you know, you just all, it's all on uh, the internet. Right. Um, and again, most companies have established a very strong, loyal following. And so they're always going to estatesales.net or we our website to see where we're going to be next. And they just follow us. I see, I see certain people more than I see my family. I see them every weekend. Um, so what what is your website while, while you're mentioning it? Yeah, our website um, is um, W, well, it's St. Louis Estate Sales.net. Oh, cool. You got a pretty good domain there. Right. Uh, we're also usually, you know, I mean, if you just kind of Google PIYP or pennies in your pocket, but that's our website. Okay. Awesome. And so, in that, do you ever have to um, do any kind of security for estate sales? Well, um, we haven't actually had to hire like security. Um, some of our staff has kind of played the role of security. Um, uh, we live in a state that is conceal and carry. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, we are our own security for the most part. Um, fortunately, thankfully, we haven't had to really deal with that. And we go all over. I mean, we're not bound by certain zip codes or boundaries. And, um, and we haven't had any, thankfully, we haven't had any, personally, any challenges. But it is, you know, in this day and age, it's something we do think about. And um, we try to be smart. We, there are certain things that we do uh, to kind of help us be a little bit safer and secure. But as far as hiring like a police officer off duty, we haven't done that. Maybe we should, 
if we can if we had an estate sale where we thought we needed to, we would, but we just haven't had that. I'm guessing if you had like, oh, here's a ton of jewelry and watches and stuff like that, you'd probably put that those like smaller items in a case by one of your workers or something like that. And it's going to be hard for someone to like run out the door with a couple of chairs, you know? Right. And if they want to run out the door with a couple of coffee mugs, I, I hope you just don't put your life on the line for them, you know? Yeah. Uh, we don't. And, and you know, and, and nothing's worth anyone's life, uh, you know, to run after anybody. And, and so, no, we, we don't do that. Uh, but we are, you're right. If there are items that we feel like we really need to, secure them in a case in a certain area, maybe really watched by a, a staff person or two, uh, we will do that. And so do you ever snag any stuff for yourself? Jeff, how, how do you become, how do you not become a hoarder? Let's not call it snag. You're saying like, <laughs> as you're stealing it, do you, do you ever buy anything for yourself? Well, I meant like snag before the sale or, you know, like buy, yeah, like get something for yourself. And then how do you not become a hoarder in this business? Well, um, if I told you I never bought anything in sale, that would be a lie. So I'm not going to say that. However, I will say this. It's very, very rare that I buy anything because <laughs> uh, I do have enough stuff of my own that I don't want to keep adding to it. Um, I see a lot of this stuff every weekend, so I enjoy it at a distance, and I don't need it in my home to enjoy it, so I'm kind of at that point. Uh, however, if there is something that either maybe I think, well, I would like to have that, or that would be a practical item or something, or my staff, any of my staff, here's how we do it. Mm -hmm. First of all, anything that I might want or someone else, I don't, I'm not pricing it at all. I'm not pricing my own item if I'm interested in it. So um, we don't do that. Number two is we do not buy it right off the first day. Um, we feel like it should be first offered to the general public first and let them uh, come in and buy it. However, if that item is there the end of the second day, then at that point, we, if we're still interested, we might buy it. But I'm telling you, it's very, very rare that I, <laughs> I don't want to haul it. I don't want to move it. I don't want to store it. <laughs> you don't need right. any more shovels. That, that yeah. seems like a good policy that you have because otherwise you would mark it at $500 and, the, you know, no, negotiate the next day because you knew no one would buy it the first day or whatever. That seems like a fair policy and practice you have. Well, and the other thing too, we have a lot of, a lot of buyers are, they're pretty smart, they're pretty savvy. And, and you can look up anything on your phone right there in the moment. So let's say I, there is an item that I think I'm going to price this really, really high. So no one buys it. Well, the people who are interested, they're going to know if the price has been inflated 10 times because I don't want to sell it. And you know what? It's, it's just not our philosophy as a, as a business, you know, and that's not how we approach it. Um, so, you know, we, we are there, we're hired by the client to sell their stuff and we have such great buyers. We want them to feel like when they come to our sales, it's there for them to buy. And that's just how we conduct our business. Okay, that's good. So what's the most expensive item you've sold? <laughs> Well, I, we've sold some cars, um, you know, uh, we've sold Mercedes, Mercedes, a Lexus, some uh, cust, um, uh, cars like 1969, you know, muscle cars is what I was thinking. We've sold some of those. Um, one, of the, one of the more expensive items that's a little different was we sold a Mastodon carved tooth for over six thousand dollars, <laughs> um, it was an incredible piece. Um, but and you know we've sold some jewelry that had some value to it, uh, art. Uh, we've sold some great pieces of art, rugs. It's you know it's it's amazing uh, what we've been able to help people sell. It's been fun. 
Interesting. I, I'm friends with a girl who uh, whose father used to own a tobacco shop. And, you know, he had this big collection of ashtrays and lighters and stuff like that. And there was, you know, there was always certain ones that had this like extreme value. And it's just amazing to me to think that there's, you know, hundreds of categories like that. And you and you guys are expected to somehow know, you know, and I'm sure you have caught a lot of things and maybe you've missed a couple of things. And that's what your your loyal followers are hoping for, I suppose. Right. Is the diamond in the rough. Right. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, we we do the best we can as we go through each item and look at it and, and uh, determine the pricing. Uh, but some houses are so full and so packed that you're right. Sometimes something gets accidentally overlooked, not on purpose, but it does. Um, uh, but we do our best to, you know, try to find every item, like I said, and price it the way it should be. Um, and it does help that we, you know, we have experience in doing research and things and clues and signs that help us say, oh, we need to do a better job looking that up because of this. We need it, it's worth more than just a random piece. Um, so that's important because we've had sales where a piece of pottery, for example, it was simple, it was plain. Most people probably in a yard sale, if they were to put that on a yard sale or, or a company coming, might have put five, six bucks on it. Well, we started looking at it a lot closer. We didn't know anything about it because the people were not around to tell us, but we started doing some research. And we saw one little mark and, and uh, we sold it online to a museum in California for over $700. Wow. So, you know, those are things that you got to really kind of keep your attention to. And, and so we hope that we're, the biggest compliment, compliment we've had are from some of our customers who say, I love you, I want to come to your sales, but I can't really find something uh, that I'm going to buy for a little and turn around and sell it for a lot because you guys don't miss it. You know, and that's yeah, a that's compliment. Cool. <laughs> yeah, and it's nice to know that you will occasionally put like that piece of pottery, like you're saying, you, you're, it sounds like you guys are open to selling things to online to a bigger market or whatever. If, if you think that there's, otherwise you might've sold it that day for $10 is what you're saying. Well, or, fortunately we knew about what it was worth before we opened and priced it, but uh, had, had the museum not have bought it, we, we would have priced it. Uh, would, I don't know if we would have sold it for $700, but it wouldn't have been $5. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. That would have been something you would have bought, maybe. I don't no, know. No. <laughs> all right, Shannon, keep them coming. That's, I mean, like, that's just kind of went down. Those are all the things I was kind of curious about. I mean, I feel like he's got done an amazing job kind of going through this process, and I feel like I have a better idea yeah. that it's not the it can be Jeff. kind of an everyday item displayed. It's just downsizing. When you're downsizing, there's a lot of good stuff. It just. So Jeff, Shannon and I are both realtors and we're also both investors. I'm curious, um, do, do you have realtors and investors that reach out to you trying to find properties? Because sometimes you guys will know about a property that's going to be sold before anybody else does. I'm guessing that's one, you're often one of the first calls. Um, do you ever put people in touch with investors or realtors like us? Absolutely, um, it does happen. I am gonna be honest and tell you though, <laughs> that even though it has happened, usually the time I actually meet them at the door at the house, there's either a sign in the yard or when I ask them, because I always ask, you know, are you, if they don't say anything about the house, I ask them if they're planning on selling the house. Because um, if they say, uh, you, and usually the answer is yes, and if they don't have someone, then I always am there to suggest or offer them that next level of professional help, you know, real estate agent or, what, or an investor that might come in and, and buy it for them. So I always ask the question, but what I typically get is 
everyone seems to know a real real estate agent, right? Yeah. Now, they may not be, they may not have sold a piece of property in five years, but they have their license. And I hear a lot, well, I, you know, we have that, we have that, we have that. And even when they tell me they have a real estate agent, I still say, well, that's great. But sometimes people would like to interview and talk to more than one just to kind of get a, a, a fuller perspective. So full disclosure, yes, it does come about, but probably not as often as the real estate world would think. Does that make cool. sense? Well, yeah, I get it. <laughs> Uh, keep us in mind, you know, we like do that. Say, I will do that. Cash buyers. And so uh, our yeah. producer has a question for you. Sure. And he he's wondering if you like to watch shows uh, like American Pickers or Antiques Roadshow or anything like that. Well, I have watched them and um, it's and over the years. I don't watch a lot of that stuff anymore. And I'll, I'll tell you, a lot of that is made for TV like uh -huh. storage wars where they open the door and all this wonderful stuff. A lot of that is made and produced for entertainment purposes. Uh, and a lot of the items that are featured, um, the prices are not realistic to what the market really is. So when someone says, Oh, that's worth, I'll pay you X and I can resell it for Y. A lot of times it doesn't match reality, but it's for yeah. good television. Um, and so it's fun. It's kind of fun to see what people have in their, the, their collections, but it really doesn't match the true world and valuations. And then the downside of that, now when I go and talk to people, they do think that a lot of stuff that they have, because they've watched these shows, now is worth all this money. And in reality, it's just not true. It's kind of like the Zillow effect on our side of things where Maybe maybe people watch those shows and they think that thing, their things are worth more and you come in and tell them they're not. But then maybe there's some buyers who will buy stuff for more because they've watched the shows. And, you know, just like we think how we think that Zillow is not good at pricing, but Zillow has become such a powerhouse that it is affecting prices because buy, that's where buyers and sellers are looking. And so they kind of think that that's what their house is worth, you know, or the house right. that they're looking at is worth. So, yeah, I equate I'm, that question to the same as like if people ask you or I, Adam, if we watch HGTV because we rehab, we're investors, you know, like, um, and I, I do, but then it drives me crazy because I'm like, it's not reality. That's the, it's so far from reality and it's what people get in their heads. Right. I mean, and it's a dangerous thing to get in your head that you could actually rehab a house in, you know, yeah. a few weeks. Well, it also questions maybe us as professionals and thinking, well, do you know, really know what you're doing? If, you know, because I saw on TV, this was selling for X and you're telling me it sells for Y. Um, but, you know, um, you're again, going my 20 years experience, your half an hour TV show. Yeah, yes, exactly. Exactly. Let's go right. with your price then. That's <laughs> exactly right. Uh, but one, uh, one gentleman told me uh, years ago that was also a, a personal property appraiser. He said, you know, we throw around terms and words like rare, like this is rare. He said, if you're the true meaning of a rare item is just that we, we call things rare too often. Um, and because most things are not rare, even when you think they are, they're not. And so that's part of the educational process we have to go through. But, you know, we do it and it's fun. <laughs> Well, when I was a kid, you know, we always heard about these certain baseball cards, like a Mickey Mantle rookie card or whatever. And so I think that that caused a lot of people my age to now we're hoarding baseball cards from when we were kids. Right. You know, somewhere in my parents' basement, I've got boxes of baseball cards. But baseball cards don't have very much value now, from what I know. I'm no expert. Um, and so I'm kind of curious if you can look into your crystal ball and tell us what, if anything, you think is going to going to be valuable, you know, that we're, our kids, our grandkids are going to be saying, I can't believe you threw that away, you know? And do, do you have any ideas on that kind of thing? Well, it's, 
it, it's almost that question is almost like asking your financial advisor, your stockbroker, can what yeah. stock should I buy? I thought you had and a this, crystal ball there. I yeah. thought maybe you would know. So it, it is and it's we a great do question. Ask our financial advisor that. So in all fairness, we ask. Yeah. That. Okay, <laughs> no, so we're not taking on you, Jeff. <laughs> no, it's a great question. It's a fair question. It's a great question, and I do think about that a lot uh, because. Um, really what happens is there are things that cycle back through and cycle back around. So things that are not hot now probably will be down the road. I do think uh, some of the toys of the 90s, late 80s, 90s, uh, some of the gaming systems um, are going to be um, more sought after down the road than they are right now. Um, for example, Legos, um, that's been around a long time, but it's still kind of considered probably new versus old, but uh, some of the, the toys, the Legos, for example, have really, you know, collectors are out there and, and we're talking about adult collectors, you know, even though it's a toy for kids, there are a lot of adults out there that collect Legos. So um, it's, I really don't know that, and I think a lot of, of jewelry has been melted in the last three or four years simply for the the metal content and so old older jewelry some um that maybe again my mother grandmother had that's beautiful that you're not going to find anywhere unfortunately is gone because people melted it so i think that may come back because it's going to be uh fewer pieces around um so that's kind of what I think right now. I don't know if that answers. So like my old my old Nintendo in my basement with like 20 games, that none of which are in the boxes or in great shape. Is that what you're saying is selling now, or is it something else when you're mentioning old? It, it's starting it Atari. to Atari. Atari, yeah, Atari and, and, um, yeah, but in it, Nintendo, but it is starting to uh, have some, um, I don't know, some desirability for people who are buying it to keep it or resell, but yeah. It's interesting because you can now buy, I don't, it's for very cheap. You can buy like a system or something that has every Nintendo game ever or whatever for so cheap. Why would they want my old one that you still have to blow off the games on and stuff, you know, but I guess that's what collector's items are, huh? Absolutely. And, and you know, you mentioned that out of the box, sometimes some things are, the box itself is more desirable than the, things that wow. were in the box, you know what I mean? Because most people did exactly what you're saying. They, they took it out of the box and they threw it away or they didn't take care of the box because they played with their toys. Uh -huh. Well, now people are looking for those boxes or to add to the toys as a complete collection. So boxes are um, still a very interesting sort of find, if you will. Okay. So do you think um, Beanie Babies are coming back? No, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Did the spiders mess those up, or what? Why are those no longer valuable? The Beanie Babies. They wow. had like spiders in them or something for a while, didn't they? They're if you you know if you can get a dollar a piece for your Beanie Babies, sell them and be happy you did. Um, and I just don't think. See again, a lot of a lot of those things uh, have they've been the market has been flooded so much that mm -hmm. there are there's no specialty. Uh, precious moments. You probably heard precious moments. Ah, yeah, I totally remember those. They, you know, again, they sell. If they sell, they sell for almost nothing. But I mean, people bought hundreds and hundreds of them in the past. Paid a lot of money for them. Oh yeah. What about Depression era glass? Like that's you mentioned, still, crystal earlier. We still sell a fair amount of that. Yep. Yeah. Does that's that include still, that carnival glass? Uh -huh. the carnival? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's still you know, fairly desirable. Yeah. And old like antique wood furniture, is that holding its value? Is it going to come back? A lot is of the it... antique furniture is not holding its value. Um, it's, you know, be there's some beautiful pieces out there, uh, but it's nowhere near uh, worth what it was, you know, 10 years ago, eight, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, now I do think that may be one of the items that will cycle back um but you I've may have house to wait a while bit. you may have to wait a while but uh yeah. I, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking that that may be one of the categories that might cycle back 
Cool. <laughs> Adam, how many storage units do you have? <laughs> I don't have any storage units, but I own a lot of houses and I do have some stuff in some of the basements. <laughs> so that's as good as a storage unit, by the way. You can tell yeah. yourself all the lies you want. But we had a, I've had a few relatives die in the last few years and it just, I just couldn't get rid of their, you know, antique furniture. So I've got all sorts of hutches and cabinets and stuff in our house now. Yeah, and Jeff, do you know find do any of the hutches or buffets or silver still sell? I feel like, you know, younger generations want nothing to do with it. And you see a plethora of it almost on Cherokee Street. You know, Cherokee Street used to be all these yeah. antiques. And yes. now they're just flooded with these uh, hutches and china cabinets and buffets and silver. And those, uh, those are... Uh dining room furniture the the china cabinets and and the buffets um those are very very hard to sell in estate sales because you're correct um most of the the younger folks don't want the big heavy pieces they don't want to fill a room with two or three large pieces in a dining room so they're very hard to sell um and if you do sell them they're pretty cheap and uh silver the silver plate, like the flatware or the old or the butter tea, dishes, do you butter remember? dishes. Um, if they don't sell a whole lot or, you know, I mean, they're not bringing a lot of money, number one, if you sell them. But again, what people are doing with some of the silver plate, like the trays and the, the forks and the knives and that they're repurposing, they're making jewelry out of it. They're putting uh, like trays on the wall as decor. Um, you know, it's amazing uh, the creativity yeah. of some of the people, but they're not buying a tea set to go home and have a tea party. They're buying it for something else. <laughs> no tea parties. No tea parties. <laughs> That's awesome. awesome. Jeff, do you want to give your contact information one more time? I'd love for people to be able to get a hold of you. Sure. Um, our name is Pennies in Your Pocket, also known as P-I-Y-P. -P. Uh, I can be... Um, Contacted my phone number is 314-703-2028. And uh, my email address is the uh, initials P I Y P dot Jeff at ATT dot net. Love it. Cool. So anything else that you want to make sure to say or anything we should we should be asking before we wrap it up? Um, just one thing I would say real quick. Um, estate sales it's year round. Some people tend to think as they get close to maybe the fall and, and Christmas that uh, they should wait. Some of our best sales have happened in November, December, January because there are fewer sales happening. And the people who go to estate sales, they go every week, like they go to work on Monday and they get upset when there aren't estate sales to go to. So again, if you're in a situation you know, maybe you're selling a client's house in December and they think, well, this is not a good time to sell my house because like, what am I going to do with my stuff? It could be one of the best times to have an estate sale. And then on that same line of thinking for the real estate agents, uh, when you can time a maybe a listing with an estate sale, because we're going to have hundreds and hundreds of people through that house. It's one of the best open houses you could ever want. That's I'm glad you said that. Mm -hmm. I was just talking to someone about an hour ago, a listing I'm trying to get in Fenton, actually. And she mentioned she's having an estate sale. And I was like, well, I want to get in there and like, you know, form our listing agreement prior to that so I can be advertising your house at your estate sale. She, she liked my idea. We've had quite a is, few say, uh, houses sell as a result of having an estate sale and people come through and like it and say, I want to buy it. Love it. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for your idea. quality time today. Thank you uh, for co-hosting with me, Shannon, Jeff. It's been awesome to talk to you. You guys did a great job with my family's estate sales, so I appreciate it. And uh, I hope people will reach out to you as a result of this. And uh, so, all right. Thank you very much well, well, for your time you today. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Take care. Appreciate right. it. You, Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.